Uh, during worship, um, you guys know this, but I just kept hearing perfect love cast out fear. And um, fear has torment. So if you have a belief system of fearing God because of torment, it's a wrong belief system. Fear means reverence. It's a reverence for our Father. Like I reverence my dad in his presence. I honored him and reverenced him. And the Lord wants us to reverence him. So fear, if you have a fear of God, he's calling you of that away from torment into that place of reverence for him. Uh, Today we're going to be taking a lot of notes. I hope that you'll bring out some pads and pens. This is going to be more of a continual uh, teaching. Take out your phones. You might want to... Take pictures of slides and scriptures. I will use a paraphrase version in one scripture. It's one of my favorite paraphrase Bibles to read. It's called The Mirror, and you can get it at Barnes & Noble's online. Uh, I I read it constantly. And when we read uh, the King James Version, just know that scholars from King James were putting things together, and they had influence from the king. And there's a lot of different versions of the Bible. I read many different versions, and uh, I let the Holy Spirit speak to me. I know that the Word of God is infallible. God breathed it. But the Holy Spirit will bring it to life to me, sometimes maybe through the Message Bible. Maybe the NIV, the NAS. But there's a lot of words sometimes or a lot of texts that we'll read, and I'm getting ready to read one, that looks like God's love is based on conditions. Let me tell you, if that's our God, we're all in trouble. It's based on his unconditional love. That is who God is. So as soon as we put our human reasoning into trying to make God fit into our paradigm or our box, we're in trouble. Because now what we've done is created religion. And all religions are based on man's concept of God and man trying to get to God where Christianity is based on God came to us in our worst state. So if you're here today in your worst state, good, because God will come to you. That's not in my notes. Believe me, I'm going to be reading notes. So if you're here, that was from Father to you. He wants you to know you're dearly loved. Dearly loved. I hope you get wrecked by that today. Let me tell you why I'm starting this series. First of all, I'm starting this series to let you know that the pastor is still being refined. In 1999, I thought, man, I truly got Father's love. And man, I'm overcoming, and I'm going to walk in overcoming. But boy, I read a book, and I want to thank Matt McCluskey for putting it online because I went and purchased it immediately, Matt. Um, I think it's called Sonship. And... uh, and man, I, let me tell you, first of all, I don't a lot of times finish books. Are you one of those people, you start them and then you don't finish? I finished a book. And I finished it because I was praying last year, Lord, I want you to reveal to me even more areas that need to be yielded to you. So I was reading this and... Uh, And man, the Holy Spirit just started pointing. And just when he points, just know it's a gentle point. It's a loving point. It's not a, you are in trouble, buddy. No, it's a gentle nudge to let us know that I want to point you into sonship. So that's why I'm starting this series. Because I know I have not arrived. 
And I hope that today there will be a revelation from Holy Spirit maybe in your life that you can join in with me because I'm going to be real honest with you about my own journey here. It's not a, I had a good life, but there were journeys and parts of it that aren't so good. And I'll share a little bit of that with you. But read with me in John 14. If you love me, keep my commandments. How many of you love God? Raise your hand. Okay, put your hands down. How many of you keep his commandments 100% of the time? You do, Josh? Wow, I, I want to hang out with you. What's that? Love others. Okay, all right. Praise God. I'm going to be honest. I don't always love everybody. I, I feel. I feel. I do. You know, when enemies attack me, my brothers attack me, I'm going to be honest. In my flesh, I rear up sometimes. But that's not Christ in me. But I don't always yield to Christ in me. I want to. It's like Paul in Romans 7. When I try to do good, I fail. When I don't try to do good, that's when I do good. That's me. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Let me um, just say that word advocate is going to shift today. Because we look at Jesus as being our advocate. It's like he is between us and God, and he's representing us to God. It's like our go-between to Father. That's going to shift today. Um, he goes on, he says, uh, to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. He lives with you and will be in you. He, they're talking about Holy Spirit. Jesus is getting ready to talk, leave, and he's not going to leave them, but he's going to give them the Holy Spirit. And I love verse 18. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. So would you bow your head for a moment? I'm going to pray a special prayer over you that I'm trusting Holy Spirit will do. Holy Spirit, will you bring to remembrance what is causing the saints of God in this place today an orphan mindset. Father, show them that they are children of the light. Now, Father wants you to embrace there is no darkness in light. You cannot have darkness coexist with light, saints. Light is who you are. You are children of light. The light of God and the light of the world lives in you. Darkness does not exist in you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to do a lot of reading today. And I want you to hang with me. And if you want something repeated that I said, just raise your hand quickly and put it down. First of all, I want to ask you a question. Have you struggled with feelings that there is something more that I have to do or put in order to feel valued, affirmed, or accepted with God? Just know if you answered yes to any of those, it's okay. The most dedicated Christians go through those feelings. 
Every one of us encounter these. The struggle could be due to an orphan mindset. So another question is, are you striving for affirmation, comfort, belonging, or affection? Are you striving for that from others, from your spouse, from your friends, from your employer? Are you striving for these things? Many believers are attempting to gain recognition while trying to hide feelings of frustration, insecurity, agitation, and restlessness. And let me just say, this could be because of an orphan spirit. Now believe me, I never thought I could have this mindset of an orphan until I'm asking the Lord, Lord, refine me. Lord, I want to read a book that's going to show me areas of my life that you want control to control in me to surrender and offer up to you. So I'm reading this book, and it, my name's all over it. So I want to, first of all, define what an orphan mindset is. Many struggle with this, so we need to define it. First of all, you know what an orphan is. An orphan is a child whose parents are deceased, considered undesirable, comfortless, and without a home. That's an orphan. An orphan mindset is a pattern of thinking that often goes back to childhood. So these things can come into our lives and be developed in our lives stemming back from childhood encounters. That's why I prayed at the very beginning, Holy Spirit, bring to remembrance those things that we need to deal with because we could be embracing that mindset. Now, as children, you can go back into our preschool and nursery area, or you could go back into your own life as a child. You receive thousands of messages from others as a child. Children do not know how to interpret messages. So someone could have good intentions and speak something over you as a child, but you don't know how to interpret that. So even something good can turn out for evil for a child. They don't understand. And I'll share about that later in my own life. So it originates in our thoughts as well as our emotions due to trauma, abuse, performance-based acceptance, and many other things affecting our, it will affect our will and our choices. So this belief system starts as children and can carry over into adulthood and we will carry these things, and it will affect the way we make choices in life. So God wants us to overcome these things. So continuing in this mindset will develop strongholds, leading to destruction. And many people are struggling with these strongholds, and it's leading to destruction in their relationships with others, it's leading to destruction in their own life. Everywhere they go, it's leading to destruction. And the Lord is wanting to get a hold of this to set us free from it. So what is a stronghold? A stronghold is a fortified citadel. Alex went to the citadel after high school. And at the citadel, you have these fortified, almost like forts that are just around these students, and they're in there, they lock those doors, and you're not getting in. Well, this is what a stronghold is, but this stronghold, this fortified citadel, is in our soul, where the enemy dominates our thinking, our emotions, and our self-perceptions. Now, know that the enemy knows you better than you know yourself better than your parents know you. 
Why? Because He was right there when you were born. He knows everything about you. He knows all your weaknesses. And He will hit you where you're most vulnerable because He was there when all those childhood thoughts or traumas or whatever you went through, He was there and He knows how to work on you with these strongholds. Wow, I'm getting a huge download right here. So, Night of worship. Now, let me first of all say, he knows what's, he, he, he can't read our mind, but he knows what he can put in our mind. So he will put fiery darts of the evil one into our thoughts. So at night of worship, here I am, no one knows, you guys don't know what I'm going through, but in the spirit realm, bombarded by the lies. So that orphan mindset is trying to rise up again. So I'm over there minding my own business and having that day of those encounters, and the next minute, Elwin comes up to me. Jesus came up to me, basically. He puts his arm around me, and he says, do you mind if I pray over you in the Spirit? The Lord told me to pray over you in the Spirit. And so I, I didn't know what he was praying, but I knew what Father was doing. He was embracing his boy and letting me know he understood everything I was going through. And it was a confirmation of my sonship. And Elwin didn't know. All he did was obey what the Spirit of God was doing. And he was doing and confirming things in me. And he was that vessel of honor. So a stronghold is a mindset impregnated with hopelessness. You been there? That causes us to accept as unchangeable situations we know are contrary to the will of God. Impregnated hopelessness. Unchangeable situations that are contrary to the will of God. So what is a mindset? A mindset is a habitual way of thinking. So in a minute, we're going to find some habitual ways of thinking. You heard Tina earlier talk about the encounter she had. She went from depression and having a belief system about herself into, which is an orphan mindset, into the reality of a beloved daughter of Abba. And this is a continual state. It's not a one-time event. It's an everyday event. So the orphan mindset, which is also referred to as an orphan spirit. Let me say that I don't believe as saints we can have an orphan spirit. Now there are spirits that are orphan spirits, but they don't dwell in us. Now we can have an orphan mindset though. Different than a spirit. And they can utter destruction in everyone's life. So this orphan mindset has brought more defeat, crippled more believers, ruined more relationships, and derailed more destinies than just about anything the enemy can throw at an individual. He might come to us outwardly and attack us, but really, the reality is our own flesh and mindset is what's so destructive. And it works, this orphan mindset, it works with a spirit of rejection, inferiority, fear, poverty, and self-pity. That sounds like me at times. You ever have self-pity party? And no one else shows up but you? It's not fun, is it? So let me just read a few things that an orphan does and doesn't do. First of all, an orphan doesn't know where his or her next meal is coming from. An orphan doesn't know how much, doesn't know much about his or her identity. 
An orphan has no security about who will take care of him or her. An orphan has no one to cherish or treasure him or her. An orphan lacks a family to to lean on for help or comfort. Now let me just say a comment here. The world system says, he who has the most marbles at the end of life wins. I'm going to ask you this, and you answer it in your heart. Have you ever said, why do wicked people prosper? That's an orphan mindset. The reality in God's kingdom is, he who gives away all the marbles wins. That's the reality. So I am prosperous. Not because I look at my bank account. That's terrible. But because I'm prosperous in Him. Have you ever said, if I could only win the lottery? I see you have. I have too. Let me tell you something. A son thinks like this. I won the lottery in Christ Jesus. Woo! Come on. I'm getting Holy Ghost bumps. So an orphan thinking is I'm lonely. I have to figure out a way to win friends and influence people. I have to figure out a way to pay these bills. I have to get so-and-so to like me. I have to be funnier, prettier, smarter, holier, faster, slicker, trendier to make things happen. I wish I had someone who truly knew me and loved me anyway. I wish I had someone who truly cares about what's going on with me. I wish I had someone who would help me. I have probably thought every one of those. My mindset was corrupted. It was a fatherless mindset. I must provide for my needs of food, clothing and shelter, love, identity, and security. The orphan has to try to find a way to make things happen on his or her own. Woo! Man, how many times have I been there? Lord, no more. The orphan mentality is one of striving and loneliness. I have to make this happen because I don't have someone to take care of me. Nobody knows. Orphan, there's a slide coming up. Take a picture of it, please. Orphan thinking stems from not having an experiential revelation of Father's love and a repositioning of our hearts towards sonship. I've had this encounter with Father's love. But this thing keeps coming back to me. And sometimes I embrace it. Keep your phones out because this is 1 John 2.1 in the mirror version. My darling little children, the reason I write these things to you is so you will not believe a lie about yourself. If anyone does believe a distorted image to be their reality, we have Jesus Christ who defines our likeness. Wow. Wow. Face to face with the Father. He is our, the word advocate, a better translation is this. He is our close companion. The one who endorses our true identity, being both the source and the reflection of the Father's image in us. 
you can understand why I love the mirror translation. Sonship is a heart that knows and feels at rest and secure in God's love. I think that's why Josh earlier raised his hand. He understands Father's love. So the orphan spirit is not something you can cast out. Okay? You, you can't cast this out. You, don't have, you have Holy Spirit in you. Because it is an ungodly belief and attitude. It's a belief system of our flesh that has been developing over a lifetime. So we have to move our belief system into the truth system. What is truth? Jesus. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He is truth. That's our belief system. It's him. So embracing this mindset will become part of our personality and character. You can almost visibly see people who walk in an orphan mindset. It's obvious. I know when I'm doing it, I'm obvious. I'll go in and seclude myself and withdraw being isolated from everyone. Starting to embrace those lies that orphan mindset Proverbs 27 3 for as a man thinks in his heart so is he I'm sure that you guys probably at times have gone through like financial situations of how in the world am I going to pay my bills this month and we forget truth where he says will I not provide for the fowls are there the sparrows will I not provide for them I have a stray cat and the Lord reminds me every morning when I go outside to get in my car that he's going to take care of me because I that cat stands at the door and I will trip over the cat if I don't feed it and I feed that cat and I'm thinking the Lord reminds me if you take care of that cat how much more am I going to take care of you, son? So you can see how that orphan mindset can come in. Orphan thinking is all about performance and how I am not measuring up in someone's eyes. Think about this. All right? We're going to do a shift here because humanly speaking, dads, you understand what it's like to have favoritism with children. Oh, I'd never do that. But then the son goes wayward, and you're like, why did he do that? You're upset. You don't come back into this house, and you have all the tension in the home. And then you go to the story of the father, father of the prodigal sons. And you see the son that was living in sin for himself, and he comes back. And the Father rewards him. The world system is not like that. God is totally on a different system. Know that about you. Enter into that. It's not based on performance. If you went out to a bar last night, then afterwards, no telling what you did, guess what? You're on the same level ground as the pastor up here in the pulpit. Roger, that doesn't seem right. It doesn't. But it's God. Now, some of you are going like the prodigal son that stayed home. That's not fair. Take it up with God, not me. <laughs> he did it. So God wants you to know he loves you. He is for you. He is with you and He is in you. So that orphan that's homeless, now our Father lives in a home. Right here. So 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. I'm not going to qu quote it as this on the overhead, but 
For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, thoughts, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So those thoughts, when they enter into our life, those orphan thoughts, they're not yours. Don't embrace them. Cast them down. Cast down. Pull down that stronghold and speak truth into your life. You are a son and daughter of the Most High God. So this orphan mindset is definitely a personal struggle with me. Because there's times where I still feel like, even though I know it's not true, that I'm a victim or I'm a doormat or I'm rejected. Listen, you don't, you don't know. You don't know unless you're President Trump. The man's rejected by 50% of society. He experienced rejection. Some people accept him. Or you're a pastor. Man, I was just with someone last week. They hang out with all these businessmen. And he said, man, the whole time I'm hanging out with these guys, they're each talking about their pastor." We are Sunday brunch sometimes. But that's okay now. Because that doesn't determine my sonship. My father, if he's the only one out there standing up when I'm done, and he's going, that's all I need to hear. So how does this developing of an orphan mindset happen? Let me just say, first of all, I'm not going to give you book knowledge. Every single one of you have encountered this. You have your own journey, but I'm going to share mine. And uh, I'm going to share some personal experiences. It started with, first of all, my dad's behavior. Now, my dad did not realize he was doing wrong. We grew up in a different era. When I grew up, your dad brought a belt out on you, okay? That's unacceptable nowadays. He would, he would get a switch and switch our legs. He would do different things, and Gloria would go, oh, I can't believe your dad did that, you know, because she had, her dad didn't do that. All he had to do was look at him. But my dad's behavior. I remember my dad getting deployed for like six months, and then I'm gone, and my dad couldn't help that, but how does a child interpret that? Abandonment, maybe. My dad left me. Or I remember going and playing baseball, and my dad would be in the bleachers, and I'd be up to bat, and I'd strike out, and I was always looking up in the bleachers. Performance-based acceptance. And I could see my dad upset if I struck out. Or I remember this time where my dad was a racing car driver and he worked on engines. And I remember going out, there was a little boy wanting to watch my dad. I'm looking up and reverencing my dad. And he asked me to go get a tool, a certain tool in the garage. And uh, I didn't know what it was, but I wanted him to be proud of me. So I ran out to the garage and grabbed a tool that I didn't know what it was, grabbed it, took it back to him, and he looked at me, he says, don't you know what it is? So as a, as a father, he's not realizing what he's saying to me, but I'm interpreting that as I'm dumb, I'm stupid, and I'm a failure. That affected my life. It still will rear up at times. But then there's friends, so-called friends, growing up. I remember these friends, I won't say their names to protect the guilty, but I was two to three years younger than these guys. They were big boys. I was over there. We would all, you know how you hang out, kind of like Sandlot in the neighborhood. And uh, I'm hanging out there at their house, and I at least had some common sense as a child. But one of the guys says, we have tear gas. I said, no, you don't. 
He says, yes, we do. He says, you go in that room and we'll put tear gas in there. We'll show you. So I go in this room knowing they don't have tear gas, but they lock me in the room. And there were these little holes in the wall, and they started pr- spraying hairspray through the walls. And as a child, I couldn't breathe. It was that bad. I was gagging. I was vomiting. That, that, that's just some of the stuff I went through as a child. Our neighborhood was brutal. That formed a mindset in me. Like, where, is, where are my parents to protect me? Or how about teachers? Teachers had good intentions. My first and second grade teacher, I'll never forget him, Mrs. Rhodes and Mrs. Garcia. Uh, Gloria ran into Mrs. Garcia at the grocery store one day and said, Oh, Roger's the sweetest boy. But I won them over by performance-based acceptance, being a sweet, kind boy. They love me. Good intentions they had accepted me based on my performance, but that spoke to me. I've got to do in order to be, and so that mindset stayed with me. And then I had a fourth grade, fifth grade teacher, This guy, man, he should not have been a teacher. Back then, well, he did get arrested for physical abuse as a teacher. I saw him paddle boys that put the fear of God in me back then that you don't want to do anything. It was brutal. And we were in music class one day. And you can't imagine this about your pastor, but... I'm in the front with two other guys. They influenced me. And so back then in fifth grade, the music teacher went around from class to class, and he came in the class, and he brings that little thing that they play. I can't, yeah. And and it's funny because do you think back at some of the songs you sang in elementary school, and you think, why in the world? Hang down your head, Tom Dooley. You're getting ready to die. They were teaching kids those songs. Yeah. One day, I'm, the three of us are acting up in music class and talking and doing whatever we're not supposed to do. And the teacher said to us, stand up, boys. We stood up. And he says, you got to memorize this song. And next week in music class, you will sing this song in front of music class. Let me tell you, that happened when I was about nine years old. I still remember the song 50 years later. I had to stand up, and it was an embarrassment. Down in the valley, valley so low. But that molds a mindset in us. And then... um, I won't go into detail with this one because this is not a fun one, but I didn't remember being sexually abused, but the Holy Spirit recalled to remembrance after I went through uh, some healing levels at Christian Healing Ministry, and it took me back, I mean, as though it just happened. And being sexually abused by a girl older than me, and then developing a lack of trust with people. Developing a mindset of, I'm a victim for others to use. Some of that is really hitting home right now with some of you. My heart goes out to you. Just know, Father was there. He loves you and he cares for you. And you are not a victim. You are a son and you are a daughter who he treasures. So what happens with the, <clears throat> after developing this mindset, this orphan mindset, it causes damage. If we do not get freedom from this mindset, it can produce very harmful and rotten fruits in our lives. It opens doors for other things. 
One fruit that can produce from this is a poverty mentality. I've had that. Thinking we're deserving, or thinking we're undeserving, so we will never ask for anything for ourselves. I dealt with that last year. It's kind of funny, but the Lord spoke to me. I shared it with Paul Cuny one day at lunch. I saw people posting GoFundMe for mission trips. And I thought, wow, man, I'm seeing people accumulate money to go on a trip, a mission trip. And I knew better, but I thought, okay, I'm going to try this GoFundMe out to go on a mission trip. I wanted to go with Paul to Brazil. You remember that, Paul? I posted a GoFundMe account without my wife's permission, first of all. <laughs> Not one dime came in. <laughs> it's funny, right, Connie? Not one dime. Now, believe me, that orphan mindset starts coming in. Nobody gave or cares for me. Mm-hmm. You know what Father showed me? Son, if I wanted you to go, I would have provided. So you shift from, woe is me, to thank you, Father. It wasn't meant to be. <clears throat> then there is another fruit, vows of self-protection, and uh, which leads to a defense mechanism to for prevent further wounding. Uh, it keeps me from getting close to others, from opening up. Have you ever shared with someone a confidential thing, and then they went and told somebody? Ugh. Ugh. Get it out. Um, it causes us to look at people with suspicion especially people who remind us of those who previously hurt us. I've been there. I've been used in the ministry, believe me, many a times. And then I'll start having this mindset of someone coming into my life, what do they want? That's an orphan mindset. It's definitely not a son. Thank you, Lord, that I have everything I can ever need. And Lord, I want my ceiling to become their floor. That's sonship. So we can make these inner vows we make, uh, and they usually start with words, I will never. I will never. So <clears throat> there's a slide coming up. Um, Vows give the enemy legal right to keep binding us up. So we're giving place to the enemy, guys, when we make these inner vows. Another fruit is continually feeling, of, uh, the continual feeling of being in trouble. I haven't dealt with this one as much, but some of you probably can relate to this because maybe you were always in trouble. Uh, we live with a knot in our stomach. For no apparent logical reason. We just feel like we're not getting it right, even if we don't know what it is. It is a feeling you get when you have done something wrong, and you know you're about to get severely corrected by an unloving authority such as a mean parent, boss, teacher, or friend. The problem is that you're not in trouble, but you feel in trouble. That's got to be tough to go through that. Another rotten fruit is twisted perceptions, and uh, such as dealing with rejections. It affects us deeply in our emotions. Or have you ever been in a place where someone looked at you, and all of a sudden you went, whoa, what's wrong? What'd I do? And all of a sudden your emotions start raging and and you don't know how to control these things well our emotions tell us something and it has to be real but it isn't real 
It's an orphan mindset. We feel it and we're tempted to believe it. So we all go through some type of rejection. But let's say you're going through a rejection, but maybe it's a level of a three or four. Well, that's not too bad. But all of a sudden, your emotions get a hold of it. And immediately, it goes to a nine or a ten. It's got to be true. That's an orphan mindset. Our reaction to rejection and personal offense seems much worse. We can react to perceived rejection that is not even real. So here's a question to ask yourself. Has someone ever given you a strange look? You knew they had something against you. But then after going to see what was wrong, they told you nothing. Everything's great. And you were wrong in your perception. We got all wrecked inside emotionally over nothing. That's the mindset that can destroy us. So the Lord is wanting to heal this orphan mindset. And the results of healing will be transformed and healing in your mind, getting a proper perspective of truth. What is truth? A few got it the first time. Jesus. Jesus is truth. His word is truth. So it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks, I come back to truth. What he thinks and what his word says about me. So there's a lot of different negative fruits. Here are some of those. Things such as a sense of feeling left out. I didn't get invited to. The temptation to isolate and withdraw, loneliness, depression, suspicion, and mistrust. Jesus took all of this away. All of it. Well, why am I dealing with these thoughts? From a child all the way up. You carry these things. And the Lord wants you to release them and give them to him. You know how I know Jesus understands? He understands our weaknesses because he faced the very same things. The very same thoughts. But he always thought like a son. He never thought like an orphan. Ever. That's why the scripture says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He had the thought of a son, never an orphan. I'm going to stay there for a second. Holy Spirit's just speaking through that one. He is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as if it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely, surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Have you been struggling, guys, with this orphan mentality? The enemy is trying to ensnare us with his trap. And it's the lies right here that will trap us and destroy us if we don't release it. Would you bow your head for a minute? Mm. First of all, Father wants you to know you are not alone. You are not an orphan. Do you know God loves you? Yes, you. So much that He comes into your room at night and stands by your bed, strokes your hair, sings songs over you, and adores you. 
I want you to imagine that as I read the scripture. Because this is reality. Zephaniah 3.17 says, The Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One will save. Let me tell you, that save is not a one-time salvation. It is an everyday experience, an encounter. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. That is what our Father does with us every night, every day. He rejoices over you and sings over you. So, Father, in Jesus' name, make this real in hearts, in minds, in emotions, in our choices. I thank you, Father, for revealing the orphan mindset that I continue to have even after experiencing salvation, even experiencing identity and grace and Father's love and authority, all these things, I was still struggling with an orphan mindset. Father, if there's someone here today that that's them too, I hope they'll come to the altar, lay it down, surrender, and embrace the mind of sonship and being a daughter He's made his home in you. You're not an orphan. He abides in you. You have a father. Even though you might not have a mom and dad here, or your life growing up, let me tell you, he's been there all along. Just come to him. Come to him. Our prayer ministers are coming now. Just come to be set free. The truth will set you free. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship.